Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before. This is Gavin, the Great American Broadcast Network. Until midnight here on the east coast of the United States. Anywhere else, uh, just figure out what time it is where you are. Anyway, and if, if it's not that time now, there, wherever, uh, then the thing is, uh, the show is, it's uh, live. Uh, it, but if it's not, then this is a recording. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is a recording. I always feel like I'm a recording. But anyway, uh, uh, we go on at 10 o'clock Eastern time. And uh, if it's around that time, wherever you are, or the equivalent, like out on the West Coast, if it's 7 o'clock, yeah, it was live, right? Could I, could I do that if it wasn't live? Of course not. Anyway, boy, I'm telling you, I am the biggest fucking idiot in the, in the, in the world. Uh, let me tell you why. All day, I have felt like shit on a shingle. Okay, now you're going, what's the difference between that and any other day where you tell us you feel like shit? The difference is today I really feel like shit. I don't know what it is. It's either allergies or it's uh, the weather or last night you, what, as I was lying in bed. I tell, You ever do this? You take a sip of like a, a liquid and the, uh, the liquid uh, goes down the wrong way and then you start coughing like crazy and you're realizing you're, you choked on liquid. All right. And so I uh, hacking like crazy. Well, I wake up this morning and all day my my esophagus and my uh, throat and stuff have been raw. And I don't know what's caused. I don't know if it was that that caused it or just uh, the fact that that's the way the weather's going or whatever. Anyway, I feel like crap. OK, so tonight I, I come on the air here and I go, well, you know, get my normal stuff. I get my uh, diet uh, soda. And I make myself my cup of coffee. Well, how, I just thought to myself, what a fucking moron I am. I've got a bad throat. I should have made tea. I'm an idiot. I'm a fool. Instead, I'm taking this coffee, which is rough on my throat. So anyway... I hope we get some callers tonight because uh, when we when we go to the citizen panel, uh, you're going to have to do all the talking, gang. Anyway, we'll get to them in shortly, probably sooner than usual, because I have I don't have anything to really much to talk about here. Uh, but anyway, so um, by the way, I want to I, uh, a weird thing happened. You know, we we always look for ways to get people to watch our programming. So all of a sudden, I notice I we you you can see this uh, the YouTube video of this in uh, several different places, uh, one of which is on YouTube itself. Okay, but then I also send it over to um, what it what what is the the name of that Facebook page? It's it's actually it's um, you go to facebook.com forward slash Alex Bennett program. Okay. Now, that's a weird site because we don't normally advertise that site as existing. Uh, but it is a page, and it's a page that we serve using our, uh, our Vimeo files. Uh, and, and we just make it available there, too. So anyway, some guy in San Francisco, there's a, there's a, uh, a site called Remembering San Francisco on Facebook. Right? But it's got something like, I don't know, uh, 29,000 followers or something like that. So this guy writes, somebody wrote like, where, whatever happened to Alex Bennett? And he said, oh, he's living in New York and he does a show out of New York. And then he gave a reference to that particular page and the file of last night's show. Now, normally on that page, I get, what, do I, what did I get the night before? Well, we got 49 views. Right, you know, I just put it on that page so some people will will see it. Uh, and so he mentions this, and uh, uh, that they should go there if they want to see what I'm doing. 
And uh, so far, we've had 573 viewers. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> So uh, uh, for all those people who somehow have found me from San Francisco, let everybody know that, uh, that we're here every night live and that you can go to YouTube every day after the show's over and watch it there. Or you can go to my Facebook page and see the show there. But last night, it, it, because he, he told people, hey, this is where you can go look. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, 573,000, uh, 573. Going, heading toward 600. So... Anyway, it's 10 times what we did the night before. It's crazy. It's just crazy. So, hey, thank you. I, I forget what the guy's name was. Uh, Attila Paul is the name he uses. Now, whether I, Attila Paul, I don't know who Attila Paul is, but uh, uh, Attila Paul Jung is his name. And, uh, but it doesn't, I, there's no way I can go to that page and find him. Anyway. Thank you. I just want to say thank you. Anyway, so my eyes are tearing tonight, and uh, I'm uh, I, I'm sucking on uh, throat lozenges, which are back there. And I should be drinking tea, but I'm not. I'm drinking coffee because I'm trying to stay awake. And uh, for two nights, I didn't. Oh, they, one thing I've been taking these pills called gabapentin, and I decided not to take them for a couple of nights. And I'm just wondering if I'm get, if these are withdrawal symptoms from the drug, even though I'm getting a very low dose. Here's what happens with me and medication. I am extremely sensitive to it. Uh, you give me a, a half a Xanax and put me to sleep on it, and I wake up the next morning, I'm groggy for half the day. Now, a girlfriend, on the other hand, it barely makes a dent in her ability to sleep. But anyway... So I, oh, here we go, sneeze. <coughs> it's whatever. <coughs> Sorry for that, folks. I didn't get over the microphone fast enough to turn that down. Anyway, see, I told you I wasn't well. Anyway, uh, so uh, uh, I, uh, I'm very sensitive to drugs, and so you know the the uh, the my uh, neurologist who gave me the gabapentin. He said, "Well, you start with the hundreds, and then work your way to the two hundreds, and then do about three hundred milligrams a day." And I I I told him I I was only taking one because three were really looping me out during the day, and he went, "And what does one do?" I said, "It makes me loopy as well on one." And he says, boy, you're really sensitive to these drugs because he had given me something else. And I, I went, uh, 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 you know, crazy. So anyway, uh, I was just looking at a note that Phil wrote. He said this guy Paul is a friend of his. So Because Phil knows everybody in the world. Anyway, where was I? Oh, so I, I'm just really sensitive to drugs. I, 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 they, he gave me... Uh, Amitriptyline, uh, which is a, an old old line drug for the thing initially, and it, I had terrible withdrawal symptoms when I stopped taking it. And he said, "But I gave you the lowest dose possible. You shouldn't have had any effect." From I went, "Okay, I guess I'm not supposed to, but I do." He said, "You're really sensitive to drugs," and I said, "No shit." So anyway. You know why I think I'm really sensitive to drugs? Girlfriend isn't. A girlfriend, she goes to bed every night and she takes a potion of, of pills to put her to sleep. A Benadryl, two Benadryl, okay? Uh, a Xanax, half a Xanax. Uh, 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 what do you call it? What's a melatonin? She has this cocktail to put her to sleep every night. And it barely, in some nights she tosses and turns. And she wakes up in the morning, and she's bright and chipper, and goes to work. And blah, blah, blah. she can't, though she can't hop out of bed right now, uh, because of the of the knee. But uh, uh, and, and they hardly affect her at all. I think it's that I haven't done enough drugs in my lifetime, and, and she's done enough to like you know, stop, drop elephants dead in their tracks. Okay, so she's she's used to them, and and uh, but I'm not, and. Uh, Consequently, I, uh, boy, some of these pills have been really bad for me. 
So I don't know. So, but the gabapentin makes me, you know what it does? Uh, would you believe this? But I can be a pretty mean asshole uh, if I'm in a bad mood or if something annoys me or it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and I found I took the gabapentin and girlfriend always said, well, you know, you're always a little edgy with me. You're always a little, you always say things in a certain way and so on and so forth. I started taking this drug and she said, you're such a pleasant person to be around now. And it was, it was making me very pleasant. So I decided maybe my watch went off against Phil again. Look at my Facebook friends. If you want to find him, I met his family and went to the cigar bar with him and his friends last month. Okay, well, anyway, thank you very much. I'm replying from my watch. Anyway, where were we? Oh, yeah. So, uh, I, as I said, I'm, I'm very sensitive to drugs, and they kind of throw me all off. But this pill has made me so nice that I don't want to stop that. So if I take it in the morning, I wake up and every now and then I get like dizzy spells and I have to sit down and, uh, and, I, do, and I take the smallest amount. My doctor says this amount, most people don't even feel the effects of, okay? Me, I'm off to the races. Anyway, what do I have to talk about? Not much, uh, because uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about, and we'll get to that. You know, it, it'll it'll come up when the citizen panel arrives here. Uh, but uh, here here's the story that kind of gets me a little bit. Do you know who Kevin Hart is? Of course, most people know who Kevin Hart is. He's a comedian, in my opinion, mediocre comedian, not particularly great. I mean. Look, I'm trying to pick, I'm trying to blow my nose, and I get this in the way. All right. Anyway, so I uh, uh, Kevin Hart is this a comedian? He's uh, I would describe him as a black comedian, uh, and extremely short, by the way. This guy I think is like a, almost I, he's about an inch short of being a midget. Okay, and uh, he's very big in comedy though, and and basically because he's a good promoter and he. All things said, he has a rather nice kind of demeanor and personality, and he's nice to his fans. And uh, I, you know, I just, I just don't think he's that good a comedian. So anyway, the Oscars and their never-ending desire to try and placate a younger audience, thinking that if they change the Oscars, they will attract a younger audience, are always looking for ways to do that. So. Uh, Last couple of years, they tried it with Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, hey, he plays to the younger people. Well, not not so much. You know, he plays to kind of a, a 35, 40-year-olds around in there. Okay. I know what we'll do. We'll, uh, we'll change the nominations, the kind of categories we have. We'll have popular film or something like that. That'll get the kids in. No, no one won't because to the kids, the Oscars are really old school, all right? And, and not anything you do to try to placate them, you're not going to be able to do. And in the meantime, you're going to lose, lose the older audience. But anyway, they go out and they try and get somebody that's really hip. Ah, current, as they say. And so they go out and they think, this is a good idea. Let's go get uh, uh, Kevin Hart. Well, the one thing you get with a comedian... Hold on a second, folks. My nose is just... Uh, hold on. I turned down my microphone so you wouldn't have to hear that. Anyway. Uh, boy, I, I don't know what I... What, I've got something. Anyway, where was I? Oh, so the whole idea is we're going to... We're going to go get somebody really hip. But you should know that if you hire a comedian, what you take with that comedian is the baggage of his act. And why I say that is what somebody will do on a stage in a nightclub or in a, uh, an auditorium somewhere is not something they would do on television. In fact, most comedians I know have two acts. They have the five-minute bit they do on television, and then they have the one they do in the theaters. Uh, and now, more particularly, things like Netflix, who will allow the kind of ribald humor that most comics do today. 
But you will still have that five-minute chunk that you can do, you know, on regular television. But you got to know that when you are hiring a comic, you're bringing with him all the baggage of his act. And what you do in comedy, anything, my feeling is, anything you want to do in the name of comedy is fair. Uh, I may not like your act. I may think you're on, unfunny. I may not like the perspective you come from, and in which case, I am not going to watch your Netflix special. But the fact is that uh, comedians uh, work in an atmosphere of supposedly non-political correctness, because if you're a politically correct comedian, you probably really suck, you know? And so you try not to be politically correct. You try to be outrageous. And um, so what happened was they decided to get Kevin Hart. Oh, he's a very famous comedian. He makes movies. He had Jumanji out this year, which was a big film for him, or The Rock, uh, or Karen Gillan, uh, any one of them, because they were all in that film, and they all contributed equally to its success, in my opinion. Uh, and um, so... Uh, uh, they figure, ah, oh, let's go, let's go get Kevin Hart. Okay, what a fine, yeah, and the young kid, the kids will go for him, and we'll get a black audience with Kevin Hart. Oh, this is going to be great. Well, the Oscars are very white. The Oscars are very, um, even even though there are black people in there and Hispanics and everything else, it's still, you know, that's Hollywood is a white group of people, very white. And they, but they try to make it darker and they try to make, uh, you know, get more women into it, you know. And they, yeah, there are more women now. They, we have a lot of women directors now, but they're not working movies. They're working television. If you look at the credits on television shows, you will see that women really make up the preponderance of directors now. But anyway, I digress. Let's go get Kevin Hart. Well, there's one other thing about the Academy and about Hollywood. Uh, it's, uh, shall we say, and I, I don't want to, I'm not saying this is a pejorative thing, I'm just saying it is a fact of existence. Uh, Hollywood is very gay. I mean, there, are, there's a, there, there is a gay contingent in Hollywood that is very pervasive. It does, it does very well in Hollywood. Uh, you've got some openly gay uh, producers, for instance, like the guy who does American Horror Story and so on. Um, American Crime Story, and quite a few others. This, uh, the Versace thing that was uh, nominated this year by the Golden Globes. A lot of your actors are gay. Uh, a lot of your, uh, you know. So it, it, it is, it, Hollywood has always embraced gays. They weren't at one point terribly openly gay. Uh, but did you know this? And I, you, see, you don't realize this. Spencer Tracy was may be gay and definitely bisexual. What, you didn't know that? Well, he never looked it. Well, get used to it. That's how being gay looks, all right? So, uh, you know, there's always the controversy about Cary Grant, um, who got a telegram once. I, I, I'm digressing on this. He got a telegram once from some guy, because when you send telegrams in those days, you were very terse in what you wrote because you were paying by the word. Uh, so uh, some reporter wrote him a telegram, and it read, How old Cary Grant? <laughs> and he wrote back, Old Cary Grant, fine. Anyway, uh, but Cary Grant, you know, it was rumored that he was uh, gay. By the way, this is interesting. Um, I had always assumed that James Dean was gay. And then I asked Jack Garfine, who you heard the interview with last night, it was very close to James Dean, um, we were, we were having dinner here, and in the interview, if you heard him, he said, and I kissed Jimmy goodbye. And I said, gee, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Jimmy being gay and all that, that kind of sounded a little strange, you know, even though I understand what you're saying because you're very European. And I, I kiss Jack when he comes over. I kiss him hello on the cheek and everything and embrace him, you know. And he said, well, no. He said, James Dean wasn't gay. I said, no, I always assumed he was. And he said, no, he was very, very straight. So all the ones you thought were gay were straight, and the ones that were straight were gay. 
I was watching a comedian in movies the other day called Billy the Wolf. I don't know if you ever remember who Billy the Wolf was. But I looked at him and I watched him acting and I went, I never thought about it. Billy DeWolf is gay. I mean, he was very fey in the in his performance. Anyway, what's the point I'm trying to make here? Anyway, so it seems that Kevin Hart in his act made some comments about gays. He also had some tweets about gays. This was like 10 years ago. Maybe the special he did was five years ago. Uh, something to the extent of, I have nothing against gays. I'm not homophobic, but if my son came home and he was thinking about being gay, I would try to talk him out of it or something like that, which I think any heterosexual father probably would, you know. I mean, you, you want what's best for your child, and living a gay lifestyle, uh, at least a few years ago, was not the best thing for your son. So he made a comment which was, was taken as being a bad thing. So he apologized for it profusely, all right, and did his mea culpas and did his, his, his apology tour. And um, so all this comes back now to bite him in the ass when they offer him the job of being the host of the Oscars. And it comes out today now that Kevin Hart is stepping down as Oscars host just two days after the Academy announced he would take on the whole high-profile gig. Um the move came amid a mounting controversy after old tweets surfaced in which Hart expressed anti-gay sentiments and used homophobic terminology and slurs. Now, mind you, all of this had come to light a few years back. And Hart told the world he's stepping down. Uh, he reads, I have made a choice to step down from hosting this year's Oscars. This is because I do not want it to be a distraction on a night that should be celebrated by so many amazing, talented artists. I sincerely apologize to the LB, uh, LGBTQ community for my insensitive words from my past. But he quickly added in a second tweet, I'm sorry that I hurt people. I'm evolving and I want to continue to do so. My goal is to bring people together. Now, earlier in the evening, Hart posted an Instagram video from Sydney, Australia, where he is touring, saying that he refused a demand from the Academy to apologize. He said the Academy gave him an ultimatum, apologize for his old tweets or step down as an Oscar host. And uh, he said that uh, he uh, uh, offered an apology that earlier... Uh, uh, he offered, well, he later offered that apology. But the thing is, he said, I don't want to apologize for it because I already have. This was in, 19, uh, this was in 2015 when all of this came to light. I apologized profusely. I did my apologies. I don't have to apologize again. This is old stuff. And yes, it is old stuff. And apparently, in spite of that, he still maintained his standing in Hollywood. He's still in movies. He maintained his, uh, his uh, high-profile uh, comedy life, uh, and people kept, kept coming to his shows. So in a way, the audience had taken his mea culpa and his uh, apologies earlier like they should be taken, and he just felt that apologizing again was redundant and that he didn't have to do it because he had already done it. And I agree with him. I agree with him. You see, I think that what was said in the name of comedy a few years back when you didn't know whether it was bad or good, you know. It, I, I'll tell you a story, uh, a quick story. When I did my show in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco got hit by something very strange. It was called AIDS. It was like we didn't know what caused it, uh, but we knew that it was affecting gay people. The, the basically, gay community was getting AIDS. So one morning, I'm doing my show, and some guy comes in, one of the comedians. I don't know who he was. I can't remember who he was. And he did some kind of joke about AIDS and gays. And I thought about it, and... The next day, I came in with an edict. It's the only edict I ever gave, gave comedy, comics. The only thing I ever said was off limits, outside of using four-letter words, which you couldn't use on radio. I said, uh, no, more, no more jokes about AIDS. I said, uh, last night I was watching a documentary on it, and it is a horrible, horrible disease. Uh, the Carposi sarcomas that people get, the, 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 the anguish in the deaths that they face, 
is horrible. And the only reason you're making fun, you wouldn't make fun of cancer, the only reason you're making fun of AIDS is because you perceive of it as a funny disease because you perceive of gay people as being funny. And I think that when we make fun of AIDS, we're being homophobic. And I said, no more of those jokes on my show. And we stopped. That was the only time I ever made something off limits because I didn't think that AIDS was a joke. And... Um, so therefore, you know, a lot of times, a lot of comedians would make AIDS jokes. Um, by the way, the only funny AIDS joke I ever heard was, you know, what's the worst part about getting AIDS? And that's having to tell your parents you're Haitian. But anyway, um, um, that's the only funny AIDS joke I ever heard. Um, the point I'm making is, is that, that, that what comedians do in the heat of an act sometimes is inappropriate at one time it's not considered particularly inappropriate it's just considered cutting edge but then later on when you look back at it yes it was inappropriate and you've evolved as a human being and so is the society and so are the mores of the society and so on and so therefore uh it should you be held responsible for what you said many many years ago and especially since you already apologized for it. So I felt that Kevin Hart yesterday when he said, I'm not going to apologize because I've already apologized for it once, was, was being very brave. He kind of then went on to apologize in tweets and stuff because he realizes some people didn't hear the apology back then. All right? So now he's not doing it. Now, guess who gets mad that he quits? You're not, you're not going to believe this. Okay, only in this day and age of political correctness would this happen. Guess what group came out and said he shouldn't have quit? GLAD. You know what GLAD is? The uh, gay, liber uh, gay, lesbian, and lesbian... Uh, it's the Anti-Defamation League for Gay People. It's the, the uh, le Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against, the Defama against Defamation. All right? GLAD. They think Kevin Hart should not have stepped down as the Oscar host. Here's why. Uh, the present CEO of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against uh, Defamation uh, said that Kevin Hart shouldn't have stepped down. He should have stepped up after the comedian announced he would not be hosting the Oscars. Uh, Sarah Kate Ellis commented on Hart's move in a statement today. Uh, Hart's apology to the LGBTQ people as important uh, as an important step forward, but he missed the real opportunity to use his platform at the Oscars and on that stage to build unity and awareness. Um, uh, uh, it, 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 I, I find that I find that off-putting. Okay. He shouldn't quit because he should use that platform as, I don't know, a, a teaching moment. Hey, I don't watch the fucking Oscars to see a teaching moment. I watch the Oscars to see people win fucking trophies that they hardly need at all because they, they made the money off those movies and they have a career and that's really the, the prize he, they should have. Uh, but I, I don't know that I want a teaching moment. I don't want him to feel, Kevin Hart, that he has to go up there and be inclusive and say the right stuff because we want him to get up there and be funny. Do what he does, okay? And so I find what Glad did here to be just as wrong as uh, anything Kevin Hart may have done in the past. Let me tell you one more story. I had a run-in with Glad years ago. I, I was always a friend of the gay community. By that, I mean I always did everything I could to support it. There were gay comics on my show. Many of them people didn't know were gay because they didn't want people to know they were gay. But nevertheless, I, I, I had them on my show. I had openly gay comics on my show. I was about as inclusive. I was more inclusive in my radio program than any other morning show or any other comedy show in the country. All right? One morning, I'm... I, I was it uh what, what, oh yeah somebody somebody called me or something and we were talking about Sam Kinison the comedian and they said do you think he's homophobic 
And I said, no, Sam isn't homophobic. You know, Sam is a comedian, and he says stuff, uh, you know, to be outrageous. And there was stuff in Sam's act, but it didn't really, I didn't take it as homophobic. I took it kind of as like him being the contrarian, all right? So now we get a thing from the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, and they say, oh, we want to have a meeting with Mr. Bennett and his crew and with the management of the radio station because we're upset by what was said on the air. We said, well, what was said on the air? He said, well, M Mr. Bennett said he didn't think that Sam Kinison was homophobic. Um... And it, it may not even be me. That, no, I think it was me. I may have said that. Or it may have been somebody else. I can't remember. But in any event, it wasn't something really. It was just an opinion that I had. And they came in and they, they were playing recordings of, uh, of, what I, what's, of Sam Kinison's act. They were taking Sam Kinison's act and then they spliced out all the intros and the outros of a particular bit. And they were just running the part where he went, you know, homosexual. You know, whatever. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this as they're sitting on one side of the table and the management of the radio station and myself are on the other side of the table. And they look like, uh, all of a sudden, what I'm seeing in front of me are a bunch of Nazis, right? And finally, I just got up and I said, stop. I said, what you're doing here is horrible. You're taking a man's act. You're only playing parts of it. You're not making your case particularly. And you're also blaming me for something I never really did. You know, you're, you're not coming in here saying, hey, Alex Bennett said something homophobic. You're thinking that because I defended somebody who you think is homophobic, that that makes me homophobic by uh, attrition. I said, you're nothing but a bunch of Nazis, and I won't have anything to do with this. And I got up. And I walked out the door and slammed the door shut. And I could hear this gasp on the other side of the door. And from that time on, I mean, I just, I just went, you know, I, I, one of the things I said to them as I left was, you know, you have had a friend for the, of, in the gay, of the gay community here with me. And what you're doing is you're alienating me or you're attempting to alienate me or you don't know that what you're saying could alienate me. But I won't be alienated because I'm not going to change how I feel about the gay community because a bunch of you people are doing what you're doing. And I went out and I, uh, uh, we, they, 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 they never had the, the, the guts to really launch a, a boycott against us or whatever because they knew they didn't really have a case but in few, uh, about a year about a half a year later we had a thing where somebody came in and said well we want you to uh, uh, do something for this this uh, uh, health club and what we want you to do is if you can do certain milestones like ride a bike for a half hour or something like that and you know something else we'll give five thousand dollars to the uh, um, cause of your choice. And I said, okay. So I did it, and I, they, I, I got the $5,000. And what I did, I gave 50% of it to Meals on Wheels, which was an organization that delivered food to AIDS victims, okay? And I gave the other $2,500 uh, to GLAD who then got a hold of me and said, uh, is this check really for us? And I said, yes. And they said, why? I said, because just because you're a bunch of assholes doesn't mean you're not doing something that's worthwhile, and I want to, I want to, uh, I want to help you. And from that time on, GLAD loved me. Uh, you know, but I mean, uh, I always found the organization a bit off-putting because they were always the... the uh, politically sensitive police. And I didn't like that uh, because you don't go around and make people mad at you who really should be your friend uh, and are your friends. And, and, and if I were less of a person, I would have been so put off by them that I would have just never had anything to do with them again. 
But anyway, I just feel that Kevin Hart paid his dues two about three years ago, and he didn't need to pay it again, and I agree with him. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I just, uh, it, the whole thing is a, is a uh, what we call it, uh, uh, um, comedy of errors. Anyway, phone lines are open now. Jeez, I said I couldn't talk because I wasn't feeling well, and look at me. I've gone for like 35 minutes of this show just talking. I wish I could remember that story about Glad even better because I don't even think it was something that I said. I think it was something somebody else said. But in any event, I just, you know, I, I didn't, I just didn't, I, that kind of thing just really made me mad. And, and by the way, you ask, how did the general manager feel about me leaving under those circumstances? And after it was all over, he said, don't ever say this to anybody, but good going. <laughs> Because they felt the same way. Anyway, I think uh, Tom Yamaguchi is calling, and I bet Tom remembers that story better than I do. Right, Tom? Uh, which story are you talking about? Uh, the one with, about the one with Glad and me? Yeah, I do remember that story. Yeah. Uh, I also remember the, uh, the, uh, the uh, when you decided not to allow eight. Yeah, be told on your on your program as yeah. well. So yeah. I remember both of those. Um, but there's so much. <laughs> there is just so much I, I want to respond to, and I just don't. Once again, I don't know where res, where to start. Yeah, but I will start with uh, to just invoke uh, George Decay. It's not a lifestyle; it's a life. So I please agree. do not say gay lifestyle. But did I say did I say gay lifestyle? You say gay lifestyle. Oh well, uh, just because George Takei says that doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> well, it is. Well, he is right. You know, and that's I mean, why I spoke it because he is. Oh, absolutely no, it absolutely right. is a I life. Do not live. It is a life. I live a gay lifestyle. Uh, you want to know something? Uh, it has its trappings. In other words, wait a minute. Uh, you know, and, and, and just like a lot of other things have their trappings, uh, being gay, a, a gay uh, many people adop adopt certain styles and so on to be part of that community. So you could say they adopt a gay lifestyle. Okay, so what is my gay lifestyle? Well, no, you're gay. You, you, def you, def you, don't, you don't let your, your sexuality define you. You define your sexuality, and that's what I like about you, Tom. But there, you have to admit there are some gays who let the community define their lifestyle. I'm still not following you. Well, uh, I think he's <laughs> talking about Castro Street. I think the thing is stuff. that there are gay people who live their lives, and some of them may seem to you to fall into a stereotype, which is true. Yeah, I mean, you could find okay. A whole so what? Bunch what of could, it, okay. Fall, I mean, what? Do you live a Jewish lifestyle? Um, uh, not really. No. <laughs> okay. Not really. But I do know a lot of Jews that do, and I say they live a Jewish lifestyle. And you what's identify? That? Oh, oh, living in New York, it, it's it's uh, uh, well, go watch Mrs. Maisel. Your you, go manager. watch Mrs. Maisel on 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 uh, Amazon, and you'll see what a Jewish lifestyle is. It wasn't as good as last season. No, I think it was. I think it was as good as last season. Uh, you son of a bitch! I I uh, I looked at it last night. I watched seven episodes to three in the morning. Then I got up. I watched two more episodes, and then I watched the final one at work. I thought it was and terrific. I, I thought it was terrific. But anyway. Hey, 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 hey. But is that a gay lifestyle? Is that, is that a Jewish lifestyle, Phil, that I, that, that show describes? Uh, yeah, yeah, it yeah. is, especially in the 50s. Yeah. We're getting off topic here. Okay. Okay. Back to the topic of hand, Kevin Hart. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say is one thing I, I didn't know about this statement from, from Glad, and, and I, I'm so glad you, you, you read that. Uh, but the statement was that his tweets were saying he doesn't want his son to be gay. He actually in these tweets. No, that was a, that was no, that wasn't a tweet. That he was, actually yeah. threatened threatened violence mm -hmm. against his son if he found out he was gay. Who's this? What Kevin Hart? Oh. And 
Oh, wait, but hold on a second. Hold, hold on a second, though. Okay. Apologized. Excuse me, let yeah. me just finish. Yeah. He may have apologized, but he did not delete the tweets until now. They've finally been deleted. Why didn't he delete the tweets if he was so, if he felt so bad about what he had written and felt so remorseful? Why did he delete them? I, mean, I, I, you know, I probably wouldn't have deleted them for the reason that they've been there for so long that people have made copies of them and they've been repeated over and over again across the web and that by me simply deleting it doesn't make it stop. Well, it shows you that you that that you are sensitive look, that, that look. you actually you know, even if somebody's archived it. To begin know, with just, Tom to, to begin with Tom the, This is the reason yeah. I don't want to hurt people. Yeah the first I personally have yeah. I'll tell you something else. I have deleted a tweet. Yeah but but, it, but I because I found out that that tweet was harmful to someone. I did not intend any harm by that tweet. But when I found out that there were people that felt harmed by that tweet, I went ahead and, and deleted it. Okay? No, but that's, so, that's fine. But just because you deleted stop. it doesn't mean it's not still out there. Well, at least it's not, well, wait, 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 it's wait. not part of the propagating. Rob? Do you think... With 330 million people in this country alone, um, forget about what's around the rest of the world and how the whole world is tied in together today because of the internet and Twitter and all this. Do you think it's possible really to say anything, almost even hello, and not offend somebody? Well, there I mean, you, you, when people like you didn't you didn't mean to offend somebody by your tweet, and so it offended somebody. You cannot, nobody. Now I know there are there are <laughs> what Roseanne said and got her thrown off the air was really offensive. But if you're if 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 you make a tweet or if you say something on some social media, you can't you you can't. It's like being on the air. You could say something and you you you're going to offend somebody. We have to get over that. We have to get over all everybody well, being. Let so me let me also let me everybody. also can, different. Wait. Okay. And not just that, that, that anybody can be offended. In this case, that person or those people proved to me that I shouldn't have, uh, I, I, that, that what I had done was something that, that, that was hurtful to them or potentially hurtful to them. And then I agreed with them. And I recognized. Wait, wait a minute. I, let, me, well, let, me, let me tell you something. Let me tell you I something. Was wrong, I went ahead and deleted it. Let me tell you something. To begin with, comedians will, and I know comedians, as you know, quite well. And what comedians do is anything they can to get that they think will get a laugh. And sometimes it's completely wrong, okay? But they think that they, that's the way to get a laugh. Kathy Griffin with the holding the, the Trump head. Didn't think there was anything wrong with that. Look, I'll get a laugh off this. Uh, uh, even uh, go to what's-his-name from Seinfeld, uh, uh, Kramer. Kramer. Uh, Kramer. Yeah, what's his name? I can't remember. Michael Richards. Michael, Michael Richards, Richards. Uh, with what he did. Uh, I, I, as I watched it, I said, this isn't a guy that's racist, particularly. Uh, uh, this is a guy who is so frustrated that nobody's laughing that he's trying anything he can to get a laugh. You know, so what happens in, a, in, in comedy, whatever, uh, 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 what's his name said, oh, God, my mind's at... Uh, Kevin Hart. Hart. Kevin Hart said he was doing to get, I think, in first and foremost, to get a laugh. Granted, he was in bad taste. Granted, he was wrong. Granted, he had every reason to apologize for it. But that's how a comedy mind works. It, it works first saying, how can I get a laugh? It doesn't care how can I get a message across. You know, how can I spew my hate? You know, many times they don't think they're spewing their hate, just like I said with these people who would come in and tell AIDS jokes and think it was positively okay. But it was okay to them because they found being gay somehow fodder for laughter. Yeah. Can I, can I, yeah. Can I follow up? Yeah, yeah, Tom. Okay. Yeah. So, so and, and I, I'm glad you actually made that point about the AIDS jokes. We'll get back to the fact that regardless of whether they just want to get a laugh line, they have to take responsibility for what they say. And if, if, if their comedy victimizes someone, and once again, I'll, 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 I'll invoke uh, Paul Krasner's uh, rule on avoiding bad taste. Never make the victim 
the the or, or never make uh, yeah the, the the victim the the target of your comedy. And there's lots of ways that you can make. You said you know there you can make jokes about age. You can make joke yeah, about cancer. But, but all I'm saying, you can make jokes about wife beating. You're not. Okay? You're, but you're, as you're, long you're, as the the victim is not the person with AIDS, not the person look, with cancer. You don't have any with argument with me, but who you do have an argument with are comedians who aren't thinking in those terms. They're thinking well, in terms should. of how do I get a laugh. They should start thinking of those. Well, terms they, no, they should. Okay, let account? me. Okay, let me ask you this. Back then, when I made that rule on my show, no age jokes, because what you're really doing is making fun of gay people. If this were a heterosexual disease that was hitting the heterosexual community heavily, you wouldn't be making jokes about it. And uh, so they stopped. But I had some comedians say, why? Why can't we tell jokes about AIDS? And I had to go through a full explanation. Now, if somebody said an AIDS joke back then, and now... Today, they want to hire him to do the Academy Awards, and then they go back to that and use that as the example. Is that fair? Because he hadn't been made apprised of the current, uh, you know, the, 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 the zeitgeist, you know, of the tempo of the times? Well, if he apologizes, yeah. I mean, if he apologizes, says, I didn't know, realize, uh, I'm sorry I've offended people. Ke Kevin Hart said exactly those words. Well, eventually he did, but as I no, said, no, but, he, he did that after he did that. Yeah, after eventually, he doesn't seem to be good down. enough to you. Uh, the fact is that he did, and came to a certain conscience about it, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Yeah, yes, Phil. Yeah, I just want to say that I actually have uh, personally been uh, chided by you on uh, on the in the studio. Uh, you didn't allow fat shaming, and I. I was in the studio. I pulled off the AP uh, a story about a six hundred. This is when I was at K. This is when I was at KMEL. No, right? this no? was I think when you first went to the Quake. Oh, okay. And yeah. and so uh, I pulled it off the uh, AP, and I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And I showed it to you, and you said, "No, no, no, I'm not going to do this. I, I won't fat shame." So it was not only the aid stuff. You didn't do any of that kind of stuff. And, I, you know, I was personally uh, told, you know, well, you didn't get on me or anything for it. You just said, no, I won't do that. Yeah. And so that, that was the way you ran your show. And it was, so it's also the way you run your life. Uh, so, you know, I, I believe that, you know, people. Uh, oh, you know, I, you, I, I had a lesson. You, you live to a higher standard uh, than those uh, things. I, I was at KQED doing uh, comedy tonight, and I had to go in and do some voiceovers. And so I was waiting in the reception area. And uh, the, uh, the receptionist said, by the way, when you're through, they'd like to see you over in the over easy offices. And I said, uh, oh, uh, OK. E and over easy was this show that uh, KQED produced with you Downs as the host that was a, a show about aging and getting older. And so after it was over, I went over to him and he said, uh, 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 the guy who was the head of the show uh, said to me, uh, yeah, I wanted to bring you in because I wanted to bring something up to you. Move your head, will you, Kevin? Uh, uh, Brian. Uh, Brian, because uh, you're in my, in your, your, my box is covering your face when you lean over oh, in that direction. Right lean over, in yeah, the yeah, other direction and you'll be okay. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, he's not doing it. Okay, well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, watch, uh, but the point was... I'm watching it on that the, the, YouTube. The point was that he said to me, uh, I was listening to your show the other day, and you were making jokes about old people. And then he explained to me why jo old people jokes aren't funny, because old people have a hard enough time living with dignity and, and living with their age without having people make jokes about it. And uh, from that time on, I, never, uh, I, I saw it. I didn't know it until I was, it was pointed out to me. Okay, He said, one day you're going to be there and you're going to see what I mean. And uh, I do see what he meant. And from that time on, I didn't allow age jokes on my show. Does that mean that everything's off limits? If, you know, the, just to be funny? No, I mean, no. I think be that's a, the uh, problem. That's yeah, the problem, yeah. in my opinion today. Well, and I think it's, the it's one of the main reasons why the left suffers in voting because yeah. so many people on the left side, everything has got to be so politically correct. We, we have to, you know, and, and it hurts us because they think, oh, just you know, just toughen up a little bit. This is a world. You know, you're not going to like everything you hear. You're not going to like everything you see. Just 
just you know move on. Don't get personally offended by what somebody says. Yeah, uh, Tom has yeah. his hand up. Tom. Yeah, uh, actually, that uh, is that because that's a, a, a show I do remember. Um, what happened was this was when you and uh, Joe Rogelski were on the Quake. Yeah. And you had done a format change where you were doing, well, Rock of the Eighties, and uh, and you were had a premise where you were still doing it, you know, 20, 30 years in the future when you were both really old yeah. and still playing the same records. Yeah. And so to, to, to so sort of to emphasize the conduit, you started doing, you know, old man senile type yeah. of routine. Yeah. And so the reason I bring that up is, once again, you didn't see any harm in that. Right. You know. Right. I, but someone pointed it out to you that it was harmful and so when you saw that, you recognized that, hey, yeah, what I did was wrong, and I, I apologize, right? Yeah. So, 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 yes, there may be people who might be offended by everything, but if you listen to it and say, well, if you say, no, I, I don't think it was offensive, and, you're, and you give a true, honest evaluation of what you said or did and go on with it, it's fine. Yeah, but, but if... If you listen, if you listen, and there's and there's truth in it, well, what's the what's wrong with acknowledging? It's not a matter of being prolific. Well, I, but I but I think I it's think a what matter but, of but, being but but respectful. I think what Rob is trying to say is, aren't we getting? We're just a little too sensitive about everything, rather than just. Let the chips fall where they may. And if Kevin Hart wants to tell uh, jokes that are perceivably homophobic, then I guess he's going to lose all the gay people in America, and that's a large amount of people, right? You know, let that be the, the, the warning call, call across the bow. He also was called on it, and he looked at it, and he said, I was wrong, and he made him, did a mea culpa and said, I was wrong, and I apologize, and I'm sorry if I hurt anybody. He did that three years ago, and yet right now this is coming back to haunt him. So if, apparently apology doesn't count. All right. Uh, you know, the thing is, Alex, uh, over the years I realized that uh, personally you're an extremely sensitive person. And uh, on air, you have a different persona, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes they they clash. But you know, ultimately, your sensitive your sensitive side uh, makes for your ultimate decision. But you know, things things clash, and you know, you're trying to do a show, and uh, and you're trying to be funny, and you're trying to make your uh, guests funny, and uh, but you're also a sensitive person. And, and so, you have to remember that you're live and you're putting up four hours a day and you're trying to fill yeah. content yeah. and you can't edit everything in your head and think, what, you know, before you say something, if you have to get through that whole process of, is this going to offend? Is this not going to offend? You know, you're never going to say anything. Well, well, if, if in that, the beginning, that, he didn't have 20 people in the studio, but uh, eventually he had, you know, he had a lot of people in the studio. It's really hard to keep, uh, absolutely. keep them in, in line. Well, the, know, the thing and, is also that that uh, back even back then, you know, when I felt that it, we didn't have all the strictures that we have today, because there's always some group that is going to complain about something you say today. Uh, back then, uh, you still I felt I was always walking on a tightrope uh, at, at all times, because if I was going to be meaningful, I'd have to walk a tightrope. Uh, and I'd have to see the abyss, but I had to know how I could control things so I wouldn't go into it. You know what I'm saying? And, and then it was easier than it would be now. I don't know what I would do with a morning show with comedians coming in and how I, would, how I would keep from getting into trouble every other day because this group or that group didn't feel they had their me needs met. Uh, you know, I mean... Uh, it's satire. It's satire. Yeah. We're not talking about the news. We're, the news isn't isn't doing that. It's satire. It's entertainment. It's comedy. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, to be, yeah. The rules have to be a little bit different. Tom. Yeah, but but once again, you did one of the assets that, uh, that I I think that you brought to show. You did help uh, comedians accountable, and and you and if they went off the line and did something really offensive, and I'm thinking right now there was a comedian Billy J, and you were doing. You know, some he was getting into some rant, 
and it ended up being racist. He wasn't intending it to be racist, but he started making saying things about Chinese people. And and you had to stop the whole bit right there. It says, Billy, do you, do you realize what you're saying is racist? And you go, oh, wow, that's right. So 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 sometimes, yeah, in, in the heat of these things, people can, you know, without intending to do that. But still, you still have to hold people accountable. Yeah, but, how, but no, do you hold them? You know, it's, what is that noise? Somebody keeps Somebody's hitting Somebody's microphone. microphone is rubbing. Yeah. Um, I'll know the next time because the thing will light up. Light up. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 the fact of the matter is, though, do we hold people accountable for something they did, say, 10 years ago when the sensitivity wasn't the same as it is today and apply today's sensitivities to then? It's just well, like are, it's just like saying it was okay for the House on American Activities Committee to ask people if they were communists back in 1935, and then to ruin their lives if they were. When today they were, uh, you know, that, that when they were being asked that question, they were no longer a communist. They hadn't been a communist for years. They were probably booming capitalists, and yet they were being held accountable for something they did in, in their youth. Okay, so I mean. A lot of people are being held to account for stuff they said 10 years ago. And, and, and the, the, when the, the sensitivities were there, but not to the extent that they are today. And, for instance, tonight I came on and I said, you know, with the Oscars, I mean, I don't know why they hired Kevin Hart. I don't find him funny. And so I guess, I guess I could get a, huh? I get, it works cheap. Yeah, yeah. I know. I guess I, I guess I could get a lot of calls or, or, or letters from black people yeah, if, if I had enough v viewers of, of them uh, to say, oh well, you just don't like Kevin Hart because you're racist. You know, you don't like him because his humor is really black. Uh, and you know, so uh, no matter what you do, you're going to be called to account for it. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Brian. Brian. Yeah. Um, by the way, you can see me now, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. All right, and not blocking your vaginal box. Or well, no, I, it's just I, the lower <laughs> lower part of the screen. I put my my little uh, box with my face, and it was covering your face, and I didn't want to look like I was going down on you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we want to get the audience that impression, yeah. anyhow, or the opposite. But uh, anyway, I sent you all a picture, a meme that I use on Facebook when I'm in discussions with overly sensitive liberals because uh, something Rob said triggered it. Um, you know, people uh, on the left who can't understand that sometimes they're going to see shit they don't like and sometimes they're going to hear shit they don't like and that it's uh, costing us dearly or it has in the past in terms of uh, Republican politicians and the right, uh, you know, winning shit, not the least of which includes Trump. So there's this meme I have of the Archer character. If any of you are familiar with that show, Archer on FX, uh, where he goes, do you want four more years of Trump? Because this is how you get four more years of Trump. Fuck the fuck up. Well, and I think that's one of the things that people love about him. He speaks and his mind. He's not afraid to say Focus on the focus on the real issues, economic inequality, but basically all the shit that Bernie Sanders talks about. That should be the focus. Yeah. As for getting offended by a little shit, that's all it is: is little shit. Grow a spine. Yeah. Turn, turn the TV off. Oh, sorry. I, 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 I can't disagree more. I, I, you know, when well, you're talking about beating people up, I mean, you know, that's not, it's not, that's not being overly sensitive. Well, that's like loud yelling uh, fire in a crowded theater, though, uh, Tom. There are limits to uh, free, there are limits to speech, and that would be one of them. If you're inciting a terrorist uh, act, or if you're trying to, uh, if you're if you're threatening someone's life, or if you're threatening danger or announcing danger that isn't there, like said fire in said crowded theater, that would be the limit. But in terms of uh, making a, a gay joke, a trans joke, trans joke, a fat joke, and an age joke. Fuck the fuck up. Well, no, I mean, me let, let, me, and, oh well. let me put it this way. You should be, you should, the, the true uh, arbiter of, of good taste or bad taste is going, right to be, to is going to be the self-censorship that somebody's going to take because they don't want to alienate those, that particular group of people. And, right. Uh, you know, and I, I see people on television making jokes about old people, and I, it turns me off to them, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, you just watch I, something else. I'll tell you. Uh, how about Georgie uh, Jessup? How, how about the real real lefty guy, Bill Maher? He makes age jokes all the time. 
Yeah. And I hear him every time he makes them. Yeah, he does. Meanwhile, he's 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 not he's no spring chicken either. No. But the uh, older I get, the more I hear his his age jokes. <laughs> but you, when you, I see people, well, then you see, see it too, right, out. Ray? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Hey, how's it going? Hey, guys, <laughs> advertising themselves who are eighteen. I realize I'm twice their age, so you know I'm yeah. not a spring chicken either. We've been joined too, by so Jack no, Bishop. Like, Jack, obviously Peter, something Peter. something tickled your fancy. Well, yeah, you know. Was uh, it the fact that I don't like black people? Did that bother you? <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, I don't like us either, but that's another story. But, but Jack has got us. Well, I, I know you. You always hated Jews, so what the hell, you know? Well, yeah, hey, you know, it balances out that way. But uh, you're a quarter Scottish, Jack, so. No, I'm a quarter Irish. Oh, Irish, okay. You know, and you know what the British said about the Irish. But, what? uh. <laughs> and listening to this conversation, what 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 uh, what struck me one what a what a great great thing uh, you're doing, but humor as far as how it affects people is always uh, how the people that are the butt of the joke see it. You know, it, it, it's like nobody in our lifetime ever milked more sacred cows than Richard Pryor. Now, conversely, the guy that came the closest was Dave Chappelle, another black guy, another black comic, milked as many sacred cows. But Chappelle, at some point, said, I'm not going to say nigger because it bothers me, and I know it bothers other black people. Uh, when you were talking about the question of a gay lifestyle, uh, I had something happen here a few months ago with somebody that I have known since 1972, mm -hmm. who said to me, Jack, I've never seen you do anything black. <laughs> and I said, I'm black. <laughs> the hell does that mean? What, that, that's what she said. The black she said, lifestyle. If, if I walk into a room, it's black. If I decided that I would take golf up again, it would be black. <laughs> and the funny thing about this, this is the person who introduced me to my first wife. And I'm going, how long have you known me? You know? And uh, it's kind of, I can really appreciate where Tom Yamaguchi was coming from. Yeah. I worked with the guy at a radio station here for five years. I was the only person on the staff who knew that he was gay. And we had all of these girls, and some of them were hot young things, drooling after this guy. Well, now and, you know. Yeah, now you know why we straight guys hate gay guys. Yeah, well, the no, thing is, uh, uh, sure. uh, 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 they were drooling after this guy. Yeah. And I, I was reminded of what another woman said. Why is it that every man that I meet that has nice clothes, a clean apartment, and a good car is gay? And that was her because take. He was married. Well, I make nothing. my case for the gay lifestyle, okay? But then there are positive stereotypes, too, overly yeah. positive stereotypes. Quite a few uh, gay guys I've encountered who aren't neat and tidy. I, I, don't, think, are, I, don't, like I, I don't think that saying somebody's neat and tidy is a negative... Um, a, a I said positive stereotypes can be just as... Uh, just as well, uh, now, I used to say... I used, disingenuous. Okay, I used to say... I, I get to you in a second, Ray. I see your hand okay, up. Okay. Uh, I used to say that uh, if I say to a black person, is it true that you all have large penises? Well, I wish that were true. Well, well, wait a minute. I bet you do. That, that's not the answer I would usually get. The answer would be, <laughs> of course, right? No denial whatsoever. I say, then if I say, is it true you all like watermelon? What kind of fucking racist are you? I said, <laughs> I, you know, it's just a matter of the stereotype you want to totally. throw out there. There are positive stereotypes and there are negative there are stereotypes. As a I'm matter of so fact, I once, I once yeah. uh, well, wait, wait a minute. I, I said Ray could talk. Oh, that's okay. Sorry. Okay. I, I just, well, as far as, as that, uh, well, no, 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 I don't want to get into that. I, I was telling my wife this morning, swear to God, I said, I wish I was a gay black man. I told her that. Because whenever I'm in a show or anything, like I just did a show at Lorraine's Hanbury, Lorraine Hansberry Theater last two weeks ago. And I, yeah. When I am at when I'm working with African-American people, I have more fun than 
I ever do with white people. It's so much fun backstage. They're, it's just more. It's just more fun. That's They're a positive stereotype. Like, that, you might not that's know. a stereotype. It's, it's a stereotype. Did you say it's a stereotype? No, no, no. It's my experience. It's my there's experience. There's enough. Ray, there's enough bigotry. Ray. There's that's enough not... bigotry against uh, blacks and gays that uh, even though, in, right. Yeah, yes, right now Hollywood is uh, it, it seems to be uh, uh, a very gay area, but there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of bigotry, and you wouldn't get a lot of parts uh, as a black person that you might get as a white person. I, I'm just, what I was trying to say was no. That's not okay. what I meant. By the way, by the way, Phil, Phil Hollywood, Hollywood has always been quite no, gay, no, even no, back no, to I the silent it's, era. It's more fun to be around. I have more fun doing a project with uh, people of color and gay gay people. We I have, just do. We have an attack. It's more fun. We have an attack of the hands here. Let's go to Rob, okay. and then we'll go to Jack. So with all this talk, I'm I'm harking back to watching the Little Rascals, where when they all got the measles, you know, the little black child got them in white. <laughs> <laughs> is that not funny? That's funny. It's funny. It's, it's a black and white show. Funny. Well, that is kind of funny. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. Everybody was they they were going to school and they you know they wanted to say they were going to play hooky, so all the kids painted black, you know, God. dots on their face. <sighs> And the little black kid had little white dots on his face. Well, it's just classic. Let's go to Jack, but then I want to come back and uh, attend to that particular notion. Uh, yes, uh, Jack. Uh, Lenny Bruce summed it up best when he said, usually the people who have the least amount of freedom in society are the most free. I agree. Mm, now, a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm still a, pondering that. In some ways, it's true. In wow. some ways, it's true. Because there are fewer choices. And when you have fewer choices, you actually have a little bit more freedom because you're well, not always... Can I, can, I, can I be Chris Christopher-esque on you? Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Nothing ain't worth nothing yeah. till it's free. Yeah. So. Um, uh, no, what I was going to say, uh, uh, I think that one of the greatest comedians of all time is one of the most vilified comedians of all time. Mm -hmm. He was a black actor. He mm -hmm. came up with a wonderful character. His name was Step and Fetch It. Yeah. And he definitely. came up with this wonderful character about the guy being lazy and, you know, I'm moving as fast <laughs> as I can. Now, he was not doing a stereotype. He created. No, he was pretending to be one when, of my employees. No, no, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> he created the character. The stereotype was created by all the people trying to capitalize on Step and Fetch its success. The Mantan Morlins of the world, the Willie Bests, and so on, who imitated uh, him. And so to this day, if you try to say, hey, let's erect a statue to Step and Fetch it here in Harlem, I would be lynched, okay, by black people for doing that. But yet he was a great comedian and deserved his due. And he never got it because as years went on, his character was considered so vile to the black race because of all these other people that reinforced the stereotype. You get what I'm saying? Am I yes, right? I right? Get what you're saying. That's how stereotypes get made. Jack, am I right or wrong about yeah, that? Yeah, well, you're right. It's like uh, uh, when I was a kid, and I, and I may have told this story before, when I was a kid, when black performers were on television, even in Bernal Heights in San Francisco, the black mothers would try to get their kids indoors to see Sammy Davis Jr. or Nat Cole or whoever, uh, because we weren't portrayed in mass media. Right, right. Uh, well, b black people right. were famous as saying, hey, come quick, there's one of us on TV. That's, that's, yeah. my, my mother used to hang her head out the window and yell, Come home, we're on TV. <laughs> you know? uh, and, and to talk about Hollywood, one of my favorite people, and I had the pleasure of meeting this man uh, just before he died uh, a few years short of his 100th birthday, and that was um, uh, Herb Jeffries, who was a big right. band singer. He was also a cowboy star he, in the and movies. He did, and he did westerns, and he was in te Texas to be inducted. To and was married to... Uh, some stripper, Blaze Star. Tepest Storm. 
Tempest Storm, yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I meet uh, Herb Jeffries because at the radio station I was working at, we were playing that big band music, and they said, Bishop does the afternoon show, so he's black. <laughs> so we'll we'll have him interview Herb Jeffries. Now, what most people did not know about Herb well, Bonza, Jeffries. Uh, what was it? The Bronze Buckaroo. That's what they called it. Bronze him. Buckaroo <laughs> yeah. did three, three all-black westerns. Harlem Rides the Range. I have that one Two here. Two-Gun Man from Harlem. And the third one I don't remember. But... Uh, he was surprised that I knew about his movies, and I told him when they were on the Late, Late, Late Show on KRON, my mother would let me stay up to see those movies. Now, what most people did not know, Herb Jeffries, if you see the movies, you can tell that he is a very fair-complected man. Uh, yeah, well, that, one of the reasons he became so popular as a singer is because he sounded kind of white. You, you couldn't yes. put a race to him. And, and Hollywood, one of the big studios, offered him a deal. And the deal was, Herb, if you will disappear for three or four years, change your name, we will bring you back as the new Latin lover. Ah, and okay. Jeff, yeah, he Jeff, could have passed for Latin, yeah. And Jeffrey said, no, I can't do it. I'm comfortable being Herb Jeffries. <laughs> very I'm good. I'm just looking at him. Oh, I remember, he was, yeah. he's very Caucasian looking. Very Caucasian yeah. looking. Yes, well, uh, 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 Tom had his hand up there. I want to. Sorry. Yeah, uh, before we get away this, I know every time we come to these this discussions, uh, uh, you know, uh, Alex always invokes Steph and Fetch it. So, 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 Jack, mm -hmm. as, as the black person on the panel, do you agree with, with Alex about Steph? I, I really have to. You know, when I, now when I was much younger, and I just gotten through reading Soul on Ice. Yeah. And I was in my serious militant phase, uh, I would have said no. But looking back from a historical standpoint, Herb, uh, not Herb Jeffries, but uh, Steph and Fetchett created a character. And he was not vilified by the black community. We knew at that time it was a character, but the guys that really screwed things up were the Willie Best, the Mantan Morelands. The, there was a guy named uh, Sleep and Eat. There was another character named Snowflake. These guys carved out that space as the black space. There's a great book about this called Mammy's coons and something else that talks about black Hollywood during the age of the uh, studio system. And uh, if you ever watch any of those by the movies... Way, by the way, it may surprise you to know that I have watched a lot of black, or what they called race films back yeah. in the day. Uh, uh, Oscar Michaud, one of the mm -hmm. greatest directors ever in American film. Never really got his films shown. And they were brilliant films. Uh, another example of a, um, uh, of oh, a black Oh, and by maker. the way, the guy who played uh, Amos Andy on Brown. Amos, or Andy Brown on Amos and Andy was a very famous director in, in black films. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, you, these people worked in such a system. If you look at any of those movies out of the 30s that are not black films yeah. and the black characters are not doing black face you will find you will notice a very interesting thing they are specialty acts so when those films were shown in the south they could be edited out easily lena horn had as her, her contract that she would never play a servant so all of the film appearances she made up until probably the, the 60s, she was singing a song so it could be edited out. There's a, uh, in one of the Thin Man movies, and uh, I'm a big fan of William Powell and the Thin Man, there's this dance uh, routine that's done at a nightclub. And if you look at it in its entirety, you say, what a great dance routine. I saw an edited version for a Southern play and that whole dance scene was cut out. Mm -hmm. This um, was the kind of Hollywood yeah. these people worked in. Um, anybody else have a comment here about this? Uh, you know? Uh, yes, Ray. 
Well, I, I just want to agree that I think Step and Fetch It was an amazing talent, whatever his real name was. Um, and my grandfather, who was a very, you know, lived through that whole thing, his two favorite actors were Buster Keaton and Step and Fetch It. And he said they were the best. And I have to agree with yeah, him. And Step and Fetch It was brilliant. He was just absolutely yeah. brilliant. And Buster Keaton, too. I mean, he's a white guy. But I mean, my grandfather didn't look at Step and Fetch but, but as like you, a black you, man. Do I mean, he just thought he was a great actor. Wouldn't you say and he was? And I went back and watched some of the things. Yeah. It's hilarious. It's absolutely Jack, hilarious. Wouldn't you say and that, moving? Wouldn't and, you say I'm that sure. this day though, Jack Step and Fetch it is vilified? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Probably well, that's by, sad uh, because he's the talent is amazing. He's incredible. Yeah, he really uh, is. Some, you, someone found over in Tyler, Texas, which is about 120 miles, 150 miles east of Dallas. Reels and reels of race movies, and the SMU Southern Methodist University Film Department did a month long festival of all of these films, many of which had not been seen since the early 30s. Right. And it was glorious. Yeah. My wife didn't see me for almost a week. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we talk about racism. What you had back then was you had race films. They called them race films. Right. And they played in places like Harlem, where there were predominantly right. black people living. And there were ra race records. Yes. There was like the OK label, which was a, a offshoot of Columbia that did nothing but right. race records. Uh, Brunswick, which did nothing but race records in those days. And, uh, you want, And then you also had, and you remember this, Fondly, or uh, you know, th we had white radio stations and we had mm -hmm. black radio stations. And if I, as a white guy, went over to the black radio station and said, "I like, I love rhythm and blues. I'd love to work here," forget it. No. Well, you, no, you know. it wasn't forget it. Uh, uh, you may not remember mm -hmm. this, but the number, uh, the big. I see you, Phil. Yeah. Okay. The. the Black jock in San Francisco when you and I were kids. Yes, was uh, Jumpin' George Oxford. Who was white. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but with a name like Jumpin' George Oxford, you didn't know on radio whether he's black or white. Now, uh, when I went How to did work, I remember I that name? <laughs> God, it just came out of me like I, you know, and, and I can't remember my uh, wife's you name. Know, uh, one of the big guys in the South, John R. on WLAC. Nashville, yeah. Tennessee. On but a you know, but you know what I'm saying. When you want to talk yeah. about where there was segregation in our business, it, it was yeah. Oh, yeah. We've all we we always had it, and the actually, it it still exists to this day. Yes, yeah. Uh, I worked at one station for ten years doing evenings, and they put people in midday and afternoon all around me, and yeah. they never moved me. Right. They paid me good money. They probably paid me afternoon drive money mm -hmm. after, you know, because yeah. I stayed there so long. And we got a new program director who was kind of yeah. uneasy about this black guy on a country station. And I told him, Danny, the audience already knows. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Phil, you had your hand up. Yeah, Jack, you know, you remember the uh, play Hair. Uh, sure. Th there was a song in there called Colored Spade. How did that. Uh, affect the black community? Did they look at it as I racism, or did I they look? Remember, I don't remember that song. I don't oh, I, either. But yeah. I'm uh, a colored spade a nigger, a black nigger, a jungle bunny jigger, uh, boom coon, uh, uncle <laughs> top. Mini mau mau. You know. Well, uh, by, well, look, so, you gotta remember that by then black folks had gotten pretty damn secure. Uh, when I was a kid growing up. Uh, the the epitome of black beauty was light skin and, as we called it, good hair. <laughs> and uh, I was dating this girl who had a Ph.D. in biochemistry, and my grandmother was upset because, one, she was darker complected than me, and... She had an afro. And my well, grandmother, you got to quit going out well, with her. Well, well, you know, well, I don't well, want you marrying well, somebody like that. Well, Jack, as you, she, as you, she's got as a you better education than I have, and she's got a real job. As you come off here on Skype, you would be what would be called high yellow. 
not <laughs> first of all, one, black people never use that term. I know. Uh, number two, no, uh, I may be perceived as high yellow to you, but high yellow to black folk would be somebody like Herb Jeffries or my mother. Oh, really? When my mother married or my a, dad. Or a guy with an uncalibrated monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> Because you look purple. Yeah, Jack's all yellow on Alex's monitor. Uh, when, when my mother married my dad, who was Nat King Cole Black, mm -hmm. the family had a fit. I did not know about that until I was 40 years well, was old. This not, was this not a racism that went on within the black communities, that the, the, the darker this, blacks were not as preferable as lighter blacks? Well, and, so this is a direct result of the slave master culture yeah you know I, I always point out that the reason that my mom's family had some money okay was because of that illegitimate son who owned my great 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 grandmother uh, by the way uh, Tom has his hand up yes Tom yeah was that the known as the, the paper bag test the paper bag test have you guys heard about that yeah yeah no. there was a um, no I haven't uh, TV comedy a number of years ago about a restaurant in New Orleans. And uh, I'm trying to remember the comedian who did that. He's dead now. But uh, but they actually did a whole episode on that where he was, where the, where the people were allowed in a club, uh, a private club, based on if their skin tone was light enough to pass. And... Uh, uh that's there were, what I heard about there were all sorts of social clubs. My mother belonged to a sorority at the college that she went to. And it's that Tim was Reed. The Tim Reed. Tim yes. Reed, yeah. Another good actor who did a lot as far as breaking down some barriers. Uh, but she belonged to the sorority. And the test was you, a woman would turn her, uh, her hand over and show her wrist if the skin on her wrist, on the under, you know, was as light or lighter than a paper bag made letter in the sorority. Wow. Yes, uh, Ray. Yeah, two two things. Um, Jack, I, I read a book once that said, I, ironically, the whole premise of the book was that before the Civil Rights Amendment, um, in, in some ways the black culture did a lot better than they do now because um, of like what you were saying about radio and some of the movie thing industry also Las Vegas had its own strip that was just for black people so do you and think that there the were all segregation segregation was positive well that was the premise of the book now yeah, yeah, yeah it didn't say it was all positive it just said that that kind of disappeared after the civil rights amendment you know unfortunately and there was a lot of loss of that sort of uh, like a whole economy power. yeah so a less whole economy that was just for black people it was yeah. more competition i guess i mean is right? that is that accurate is it accurate? Uh, to some degree, yeah. Because as Phil said, you got more competition. When you can't go into the man's coffee shop, that creates a business opportunity for the people that have a coffee shop you can go into. I, I see. Yeah. Well, let me uh, ask you, let me uh, ask you this the question. Thing, oh, sorry. I, I, I was going to bring up two th things uh, culturally and see what people think about them and especially you too jack one amos and andy and two song of the south mm -hmm. now i wrote a article for hustler one of my columns that i had when i was doing a, a column every month for hustler was titled who killed uncle remus mm -hmm. and what it was about was how this picture had been completely eliminated from the mm -hmm. Disney catalog. The only place you could buy a copy of Song of the South was in uh, Asia. And there it was on a Laserdisc, DVD, whatever. The only way you could see any part of it here was perhaps when you saw Uncle Remus singing Zippity Doo Dah. And that right. was it. Uh, I have that whole film. I have watched that whole film. There, it was to begin with. It, it, Disney went and hired a Jew who he didn't like Jews that much, but he hired a Jew 
to write the screenplay because he felt he would write it in a way that wasn't racist. Uh, and I watch that film and I go, this is a film about people, get, a, a young boy befriends an old black man who tells him these wonderful stories because the kid's family doesn't love him and doesn't treat him right. And it shows on how blacks and whites get along together and how they can have a, a, a bonding together. It's a beautiful film. And it's complete. You can't find it anywhere because Disney's afraid people will perceive of it as racist. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is Amos and Andy, in which I've often said, where else on television could you find an all-black program in which blacks were not only portrayed in the normal sitcom stereotypes of being buffoons and silly, but also as lawyers, doctors, professionals? Th those those. People were all portrayed on Amos and Andy. And it was, by the way, an all-black cast that uh, uh, gave a lot of black people work. And what happened to it? You know? We became politically correct. And the somehow... The pendulum swung too far. Well, uh, the, NAAC, the, the NAACP worked to get it removed from syndication. Well, well, the thing is, you got to remember, a lot of that had to do with how many portrayals of black life did you see at that time other than Amos and Andy, other than Beulah, other than the Stu Irwin show with Willie Best. When I see in those cases of Willie Best and Beulah and so on, I do consider those stereotypes. Yeah, I did not consider but... what was going on on Amos and Andy a stereotype. They were cartoon characters because it was a sitcom, but, yes. but it was balanced off by the fact that you had yeah. professionals, you had the doctors, you had lawyers, uh, you had the, the long-suffering wife of Kingfish who uh, uh, was always portrayed with, uh, with a great deal of dignity, you know. Amanda Randolph was her name, I think. Uh, Amanda Randolph played uh, Sapphire's mother. Oh, okay. But yeah. uh, you're right in that uh, you, you had black lawyers, black, black doctors. Amos was a businessman who had his own cab. He was a very, uh, and a, and a very good businessman and a very yeah. hardworking businessman. You know, but the problem was, it wasn't until, to show you the impact, that did not begin to, the role of black people portrayed on American television. Yeah. Just television now. Mm -hmm. Really did not begin to change until 65 with I Spot. With, with Cosby. Yeah. Yeah. And even there, uh, Cosby, for the first couple of years, could have no romantic interest. Yep. Maybe that's what set him off. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, Mr. Bennett, excuse me. I know it's your show, but i got to give him the bell for that one. Yeah, yeah. And what was interesting was when he did get a romantic interest, it was Nancy Wilson who 20 years later would play his mother. Really? Yeah. On the Cosby yes, show. Yes, Ray has his hand up. I took a, a year of African-American studies when I went to Cal, and it was all about... Uh, uh, people of color in film mm -hmm. and always the rule was if it was a regular Hollywood film that if there was a romantic interest with anybody with a person of color they had to have a dire ending they had to be killed or maimed or destroyed in some way all every single movie I mean I, it was like a not, punishment or <laughs> not Sidney Poitier <laughs> Uh, uh, starting to turn things around. Well, that was later. Yeah, it was yeah. the sixties. Yeah, was later. Yeah. I'm talking. Six... I'm talking about like between the thirties and the fifties, mostly, uh, and or earlier guess, even. Guess who's coming to dinner? Didn't happen until sixty-seven. Yeah. And even in that one, they were worried about showing the kiss between the yep. couple. Yep. Yeah. My God, Maybell, get out the gun and shoot the screen. <laughs> Jack, I saw I saw a play at Berkeley Rep about ten years ago called Yellow Man, and it dealt with um, prejudice in the South between members of the African American community against people who were light skinned, 
It was yes. really interesting. Yeah. I had, I didn't know this was something that went on. It's interesting in my mother's family, yeah. mainly people who are lighter complected than I am. Her siblings, except for one, all married people darker. And I asked my favorite uncle, who uh, I, I told his son his dad had my back from the day I was born to the day he died. And I asked my uncle about that. And he said, we got so tired of being put down as half white, yellow, whatever, that we sort of, without even discussing it, decided we didn't want that burden for our kids. Yep, that's what this play was about. It was really good. Yeah. I had, and I had no idea that that was something that even went on. I was blown away. Well, well Ray, it's like Northern Italians and Sicilians. It's, it's the same thing. It's that's right. Same. That's Tom. Right. My grandmother hated it. goes on in every culture. Yeah. Tom's got his hand up. It goes on in every culture. Darker yeah. their skin, the more they're uh, discriminated against. No, this was the other way around, but that's just because okay. it was in the South in a specific area. Tom. The lighter skinned people were discriminated yeah. yeah. Sorry. I just felt inspired to sell, to uh, share a story I, I found out about uh, Petulia Clark a oh, few yeah. years ago. Uh, maybe, Jack, maybe you would know the story. Petula, actually. Uh, it's not Petula. 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 Whatever. Uh, but anyway, uh, she was doing a special for um, NBC and uh, TV, and uh, she decided to have Harry Belafonte yes. on. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. You heard the story? Well, no, I heard. Of course, tell them the story. Okay, but let, anyway, let, let's so, mention so she. she let's mention have... me, mention before you tell the story. She was British. Okay, British have an yeah. entirely different sensibility. Go ahead. Well, anyway, so so the way I read the story was, uh, she had Harry Belafonte. They did a duet together, and at the end of the duet, they just reached out and held each other's hands, and. Uh, and uh, the, the I guess it was her husband was a producer. Clark's husband was a producer on this uh, on this uh, special. And NBC was says, "You have to redo it." It was, we, it we was worse than that. It was worse than that. It was was worse than that, Tom. It was the sponsor who complained. Well, yeah, and, and said no. And the and the sponsor, uh, the head of the uh, the company that was sponsoring it, said. Uh, no white woman will touch, it will clasp hands or something or embrace uh, a black person on any TV show I'm sponsoring. Yeah. And what I liked about the story was the, 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 her husband came back and says, no, the, the scene's been shot. You know, we're not redoing it. Take it or leave it. <laughs> no, I, I even heard something to I've the extent it. that maybe yeah. it was uh, it was cut. Uh, they said no, cut it, it and they said okay it's been cut and then they ran the the print and of course it was still in there well the yeah. version of the story i read was that he refused to cut it and 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 the uh, network and the sponsor backed down and let it show but uh but it was even up into the 60s the reason i mentioned this the story yeah. is even up in the 60s uh it was really difficult to get uh southern tv affiliates like to shows like sesame street yeah, they wouldn't show Sesame Street for years. They would show, uh, you know, Mister Rogers with the uh, black. Uh, uh, Nat Cole had a TV show, fifteen minute TV show, every day on NBC. That got canceled after like thirteen weeks because well, they they kept it for a year. For how long? For kept the for Nat Cole season. show for a whole year, uh -huh. but they could never find a sponsor. Oh, okay. And I've seen those shows on uh, on on uh, here on Channel Nine. And they were fantastic shows that that uh, Kit Cole was doing. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, it's really sad. Well, yeah. everybody that knew Nat wanted to work with him, and wanted to help him out. Uh, you, we talked about Vegas a little while ago. You know, the most important thing that Sammy Davis ever so did in Vegas. What? And he was the first black performer to do. Uh, to stay in a hotel, a white hotel. No, yeah. no, that wasn't it. You know, the, that was Sinatra. Well, no, Did Sinatra. He went to the buffet at the Sands. No, no, he was the first black performer ever to walk to the edge of the stage and talk to the audience. Before Sammy did that, the black acts came out. They did their number, they, and and they left by the back door because they couldn't stay in the hotel. 
Well, of course, the other story was that Frank Sinatra found out that they said, no, he's got to stay at the Tropicana, I think, is where Black Axe stayed. That's right. And uh, Sinatra said to the head of the, uh, uh, I think it was the Sands Hotel, where he was performing, uh, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., find him a room here. And they said, well, I'm sorry, he can stay at the Tropicana. I said, no, you don't want to have Sammy Davis Jr. stay here, then you don't want me to perform here either. And I won't perform unless you let him stay here. And Sinatra was very much into that sort of thing. He was very much for equal rights for everybody. Yeah, and, and, huh? and Sinatra was quietly behind much of the civil rights movement out the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Uh, yes, hello to Bree, by the way, out there in Dubai. All we see is a picture on him, but we know he's there. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, uh, Ray. I, I just, I've always felt that uh, Sammy Davis Jr. had two things going for him. One, he was very good friends with Frank Sinatra. And two, his talent was so immense that he could do anything he wanted. Because I don't mean that, man. He was incredible. I mean, he truly was. But, I mean, that's how good a black person had to be to get respect. And it was ridiculous. I mean, he was, he was that good, I think. He had to become a Jew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, it was, you know what's funny, though? I always found funny is him and Sinatra were such good friends, but they would, they would make racist jokes back and forth all the time together, and it was in good fun. There didn't seem to be oh, any... Oh, some of the stuff that Sinatra did with uh, Sammy Davis Jr. on stage was absolutely racist. Uh, yeah. But yet, yet, Frank was one of the major... I mean, his mother was a right wi left winger, real heavy left winger, and he, didn't mean uh, it. he grew up in that. And to him, you know, it was a black person had the same rights he did. But on stage, you could make a joke about him being black. You know, right? You would just make they, it was they would show. come out and they would and be holding him in their was, arms and say, "I want to present this award to you from the NAACP." That was one of the yeah. That's one of my favorite routines they did. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just think it but was in really good humor, and I thought couldn't do it today. Can't do yes, that yes, Tom. Well, it gets back to what we were saying earlier. Was it racist or just racial? I mean, you can make jokes about race as long as as the jokes aren't putting pe uh, bl black people down, right? I mean, in, in a way, since Sammy Davis Jr. could joke about himself, it's just like Ray Charles could could uh, joke about his blindness, right? right? Right, but right. Uh, Jews could joke about Jews, you know, sure. the, uh, the Borscht Belt or any of those types of sure. things. Uh, Hell, Stevie uh, Wonder used to joke to me about his blindness. He would call me up at 3 o'clock in the morning on my show sure. and saying, I'm taking the car out for a drive. You want to come with me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I, was at, I, I was at a party once with him, and he comes in. And uh, after a while, I decided I'll sidle up to him and say hi. And I sidle up to him. I said, uh, Stevie? And he says, yeah. I said, it's Alex. He says, oh, Alex, hi. I said, you know, you've really become too big a star. He said, why? I said, you walked in the room. He didn't even notice me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you remember the Saturday Night Live routine that they did? I think uh, Eddie Murphy played Stevie Wonder. And uh, it was Stevie Wonder for Canon AE, you know, K Canon EOS cameras. And he was shooting guys playing tennis and he missed all the shots. <laughs> he was snapping away. And then they had him on a tennis court and he was missing all the balls. He was just, <laughs> that was hysterical. Now, would that be considered something you couldn't do today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I mean, you couldn't, you, Sinatra couldn't do most of his act today no, between the sexist jokes and the race stuff and the, this and the that. No, you know. Yeah, you can't judge people by 30-year-old or 40-year-old standards well, here, let me, and then let me, judge them Let me them bring today. something up here. Let's go really back, okay? Let's go back to minstrel shows, okay? Now, we all look at them and go, how racist is that? A bunch of white guys dressed up as black people, and the black guys that may have been working the show had to have white lips, Right. Anyway, um, or, or, or going to heaven on a mule with Al Jolson in, I'm mm -hmm. trying to remember which picture it is now, which it's like nothing but black people around this guy wearing blackface kind of looking daggers at him like they want to kill him. But anyway, the point I'm making is, is that 
minstrel shows, really nobody thought of those people on the stage as imitating black people. It was a stylization. Everything in theater in those days, you go to back to French uh, theater, and there was a stylization and so on. This was a kind of style of entertainment that didn't have anything to do with racism. As a matter of fact, it almost seemed like they appreciated the music of blacks and the talent of blacks. Would you disagree with that, Jack, with that assessment? I would disagree with the question of talent and, and music. I mean, American music has always been vanilla fudge ripple. Yes. But uh, uh, there were black minstrel uh, troops that performed in blackface. Yeah. Yeah. They did the but white lips, you right? Think that if it were if they were if they were black minstrels, yeah. that the white audience would embrace them at that time because yeah. of uh, prejudice. Yeah, uh, I can't think of the name of the guy, but one of the biggest acts uh, in the minstrel business for years. We and said years, minstrel, was... folks, not minstrel. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the minstrel. You got your minstrel right here. <laughs> take take a look at this. Yeah. Uh, but his name was Ben something, and I can't remember what his name ben was. Ben Her? No, Ben Carter. Ben Dover. Uh, <laughs> stop it. But he was a black performer. Mm -hmm. He made top dollar and w w was in embraced by the audience. Another good example. You don't, don't have to go back that far. Biggest, one of the biggest country singers in the business in the 60s and 70s. Charlie Pride. Charlie Pride. Yep. I love Charlie Pride. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and when I met Charlie Pride, he said to me, Jack, I didn't know. Oh, by the way, you uh, <laughs> while we're, while uh, you just ticked something off of me, because the other night you, you mentioned something, you couldn't come up with the name, about a guy in France who his entire act was coming out and farting, farting. the music. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, his name was Le Petamain. <laughs> and he, 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 he would he would that's come where Mel Brooks got the name that's where he got the name yeah, yeah. Ah. and Lepetamame was famous for having uh he had tails uh, tucks and tails and then he would pull up the tails and there was a big hole in his pants and then he would start farting to music and he was what? he was literally the biggest v act in show business in France for many years running so. hey they they like Jerry Lewis you know, uh, I, I, I don't think the French have that much. And they, and they were, they, were, they, well, they always made a point of the good. fact that he did his act and it was odorless. Okay. Yeah, he thought so. Because otherwise <laughs> nobody would have wanted to buy a seat in the front, front row, you know. That has yeah. to be a fake name because in French, pet means fart. Yeah. Yeah, but, his, yeah. but the name he used was Le Pet Stage Yeah. 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 Uh, Alex, I will go to my grave remembering this now yeah, well now you see i mean i was going to call you up and tell you it was lepetamine i've always known that for some strange reason uh, there's a great book uh, i think it was actually written by ricky j the late ricky j called uh fireproof what uh something women and uh, fireproof women and something else and it's a history of all the kind of freak acts that used to appear in show business and uh lepetamine has a whole chapter uh, on that. Yeah. So. I'd be curious to see what people think. Has everybody here seen the movie Blazing Saddles? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, that movie couldn't be made today. Isn't that like a shame? Yeah. Uh, it, it, and yet, well, uh, it, it, it was the least racist movie I've ever seen dealing with race that way. Uh, yes, uh, Tom. You could say it was it, it was the, the making it was poking fun at race. I mean that was that was the whole point of the movie, it was about poking fun at race. So so yeah, they you could make it as much as much today as you could then. You think you I could? Mean, oh yeah, I oh, think so. Wow. I mean because it's you know. <laughs> well, I I love the part where they where they it, go. It's poking fun at race. Excuse me for using the language, but this was in the movie of uh, uh, of. Uh, uh, Slim Pickens saying uh, to the black people, why, why don't you guys sing us one of those nigger spirituals that you sing so well? And they go, okay. And they start singing, I get yeah. no kick from champagne. Mere alcohol <laughs> does. And Cleavon Little with the, where are the white women at? And by the way, <laughs> one of the writers on that film, oh, one, of the, one of the writers on that film, Richard Pryor, you know, so. Yeah. 
I, brilliant. Yeah, yes. Uh, I, I, I don't right. know if you talked about this earlier, but it seems like some comedians still get a still get a pass, like the late Don Rickles, uh, Lisa, Lampin- Lisa Lampanelli, uh, and others, I'm sure, on the racist stuff. And like, what is that? How does that? What is that? I mean, how what they get a pass, and other it's comedians the venue. don't. It's the venues, I maybe that they. But, but, but you don't hear about like like. But Roseanne Barr loses her career. I mean, I, because well, Roseanne Ro- Barr is a Republican or I, Roseanne, conservative. No, no and, Roseanne Barr made her comments on Twitter, not during an act. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm just trying to see. Roseanne what Barr made a political comment on and, Twitter that wasn't an on stage as part of a, a routine. By, by the doing. way, okay, there is no sense. way. Sense, there is yeah. no way in a Twitter. Okay. I get it. You can be sarcastic. No. Because you can't write sarcastically. It's impossible. It is impossible. So, you know, what would Roseanne Barr's inflection have been in that? We don't know. Exactly. So you assume the worst. So you don't write tweets. Yeah, you don't. If you you consider sarcasm important. And if you're Kathy Griffin, Griffin, you don't take pictures uh, with Donald Trump's head in your hand. That was stupid, too. Yeah, it was. Like Donald Trump, that was as terrible. much as that I hate stupid. Kathy Griffin, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was stupid. Yeah, it, just, it reminds me of uh, what uh, they they said about Abraham Lincoln that he wrote a lot of letters, but he didn't send them. So uh, you know, he had written letters to Grant and and so forth. And uh, I, I don't know if they surfaced years after his death and Grant's death, but uh, you know, he he wasn't happy with them. And uh, he so he wrote these letters, but it's like doing Twitter and not pressing send. And, you know, you can you can express yourself, but you don't have to send the message. It just Yeah, but you know something? The problem today is that message is sent with one click of a button. You know, it's Mm -hmm. this thing. One click. And I like to buy it now. And there's no and you. (laughs) Yes, you can take it back. But once you've sent it, some people are going to get it. And so it's going to show up on some people's queue. Uh, and you can prevent it from uh, maybe being retweeted, but not the original tweet is not going to be erased. If somebody's got it on their screen, it doesn't suddenly disappear. I felt bad for Roseanne Barr. If I remember correctly, she realized she fucked up and went back pretty quickly well, and here's, deleted it. Well, here's what I don't understand. We live in an age where there are two things that are wrong. Whatever is not considerably currently uh, right to say or do, and the other is apologizing. People are not allowed to apologize. She apologized right. profusely for that. So they say, okay, you apologized. You know you did wrong. Good for apologizing. We've renewed your show. You're on for next year. No. Louis C.K. apologized right away, too. And he didn't get any credit for it. Yeah. No, I think he got people, a- people don't want the apology. They, they would rather go and continue to attack than, than be big but enough let to me, take the apology. Let me tell you something I love about political correctness is that because there are so many stories about it out there, the New York Times, for instance, now feels compelled that they have to tell you why something somebody did wasn't politically correct. And so the other day to read the New York Times and saying, he told me to put his penis in my mouth in the New York Times was wonderful to see in print. (laughs) You know, when, when did you ever think you would see those words together? In the New York Times, he told me to put my his pen he to put my mouth around his penis or whatever. It's all the news that's fit to. Print. It was describing the the Les <laughs> Moonves situation and the woman describing what went on, and they You're printed it. Right. In the old <laughs> days, they wouldn't even print the word penis for crying out loud. So yeah. thank you. you about for- two, did you hear about the two marine pilots that got into trouble uh, using their contrails to? <laughs> a penis in the sky <laughs> that's <laughs> talent I heard that's about awesome. <laughs> yeah, you know i mean and these guys are uh, they're, they're not facing uh court martial but they're facing disciplinary well, they, action now, now we'll get a feminist to call our show and say well Just why like didn't they why didn't they make push, a uh, why didn't they make a vagina you know because it's harder to draw a vagina okay <laughs> Just a couple of <laughs> couple of curvy line, lines you got a penis uh, if they put weed in the incense burner a lot of folks would suddenly say, hey, man, 
This stuff doesn't make any sense. Okay, so, exactly so you know, we got about three minutes left here. Speaking I want to know, rebels. what do we do about this? Is all this political correctness just getting out of hand? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. it is. Completely. How about you, Tom? One thing, I'm really getting sick of the term political correctness. <laughs> okay. I just get, I mean, it is just banished about, and everybody has their own definition. I mean, the original term actually came from, from Marxists. You know what I mean? And, how, and, and everybody's just throwing it about. I just say, you know, what's the matter of being respectful? It, it, you know, respecting somebody's feelings and recognizing, hey, you know, if I'm hurting you, but, but I, you know, I, I need to own up to that also, and apologize. Also, and that's gets back to the if, other thing. If, just one more thing. But yeah. And that is, is it, you know, apology is, is a question of, is it a heartfelt apology? Is it, gee, I'm sorry I got caught. You know, people can recognize whether an apology is heartfelt or if somebody really means it, and they can say, I know why I did wrong. This is why I did wrong. And you know, I let a lot of stuff roll off my back. Uh, you know, uh, during this show, uh, not today, but you know, at times, you know, it's it's like how you how you take it in. You you can choose to be. Uh, uh, offended. I don't think I, I've, say, said some, hey, I, I, I've said some nasty things. I don't choose to be victimized, and I have been victimized. I I I was physically assaulted in high school and gay bashed, and I just refuse to accept. Well, it. I always like to say that it, it, people it, refuse to accept. Well, then you and I have you well, you and I. Wait a minute, then, wait a minute, wait a minute, minute. Hold on a second. Bashing and words is different. Tom and I have something in common. I was gay bashed in high school as well and i wasn't even gay right because but if you, you if, if your father took you to the symphony instead of taking you out to learn how to play baseball and what are you a fag or something you know yeah. so i mean i was gay bashed and it made me get into sports yeah and then no one gay bashed me anymore oh because you got into sports yeah and i yeah. and i lifted weights like crazy because i was sick of it no i was in the shit kicked bash. out of me all the time yeah, and the funny part is, bashed. being gay bashed in high school, many of those kids didn't even know what being gay was. No, it was you just know. if you weren't one of the what I queer or something well developed. You know, that was that was <clears throat> the term. Well, anyway, it's just that I think that uh, when political correctness, uh, and I know you don't like the term, but it does exist, starts dictating everything we do and starts impinging upon the arts that, oh, well, that's that's not in good taste or that isn't politically correct. I'm uh, politically correct because I like Trump. Well, uh, one thing I was going to say, <laughs> Phil, oh God. is God, no God, you, Phil. God knows I've said horrible <laughs> things about you on this show. And much to your credit, not once have you ever taken it to heart. You that's know? right. Because you understand I'm doing in the nature of high-spirited discussion. I also know that you're two people. Yeah, yeah. No, and, 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 and you, the real Alex is extremely sensitive. Yeah, and you also understand that I like you a lot, you know, as a friend. So I, I mean, like you too, Phil. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, let this be then Thank the first step towards international brotherhood. My God. Where's the yeah, kumbaya? I'll, I'll get your, hell with this. Well, I'll, I'll get your Republican ballots in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> um, a, a, anyway, uh, uh, I, I wish I knew what the how to describe each of you in a racially insensitive way, but I can't really do it well uh, i'm a dago i, I think uh, phil phil's, a, phil's an ofe motherfucker okay <laughs> that, that we know for I'm sure i'm a spudlock we're a uh, cocksucker okay good <laughs> and a damn good one at that anyway hey listen i'm sucking that pencil <laughs> 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 The rim job. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. All right, all right, all right. That, now we're getting <laughs> insensitive. <laughs> I read. Hey, thank you all. First of all, to Rob Alfano, Phil Meyer, Ray Renati, Tommy Amaguchi, Brian Ludwig, and Bree. You didn't say anything. Well, <laughs> next time. Next time, uh, and of course, uh, 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 Jack Bishop, who is next with the intersection. Thanks for being here, all of you. Give me a big good wave goodbye so they can. Uh, See there. They, oh, that that Ray, you're really good at it. Anyway, thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. That's our citizen panel for tonight. That's our show for this week, uh, and uh, a good one it's been. Really good one. Uh, and I just made it to the end before being so tired I almost feel like passing out. 
Anyway, Jack Bishop's next with The Intersection. Uh, on uh, Tuesday, we come on right after Damian Chaplin does the exchange at 10 o'clock. Same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.